This is going to be verse by verse of Romans chapter 16. And in this chapter, Paul is just going through and giving shout outs basically to his friends and helpers in the ministry. And this shows us that Paul's not a lone ranger and he doesn't consider that he's the only one saved. He realized that there's other people in the body of Christ other than himself. And it also shows us that there's nothing wrong with giving honorable mentions and, you know, thinking someone else is a, is a good Christian other than ourselves. And I thought we could look at some of the descriptions of these people and maybe try to have these good characteristics in our life. So, verse 1 of Romans chapter 16 says, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Sincrea. So a woman can definitely do something for the Lord. She just isn't supposed to have authority over the man. 1 Timothy 2.12 says, But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. And you see all these women preachers on TV, and you see all these, these women preachers that are very deceived and deceiving others. They don't even use the King James Bible. Uh, they are completely contrary to this verse and are in rebellion against God. Uh, Joyce Meyer and Paula White and anyone else that's a woman who's trying to preach is preach and pastor a church is, is completely going against this verse. Now, every woman is supposed to preach the gospel, but she's not to have authority over the man. But this doesn't mean she can't give out the gospel and tell others how to be saved and have a part. But this woman named Phoebe is labeled as a servant, and it's actually a compliment to be called a servant. Philippians 2.4 says, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. So if you're servant-minded, that's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with doing something for somebody else just so that they don't have to do it themselves. And But not many people want to serve. They just want to give out the orders. And more marriages would work out if the husband and wife did things for each other just to help each other out. But Paul says perilous times shall come, and we know perilous times are here because men are lovers of their own selves. Romans 16.1, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Sincrea. So this is a local church, a local group of believers in Sincrea. In the Bible, you have local groups of believers called a church, and then you have the church, which is all born-again believers. So Romans 16, 2 says that ye receive her in the Lord as becometh saints, and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you, for she hath been a succour of many and of myself also. Now notice Paul said to receive her. Romans 15, 7 says, Wherefore, receive ye one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. There is no excuse not to receive a Christian who is living for the Lord. He said to assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you. This once again goes back to being a servant and a helper. He says, assist her. And when Chris Paul or Stephen Curry or LeBron James passes the basketball to another player and it leads to a score, this is an assist. They are considered unselfish players. Are you unselfish in your Christian walk? Do you esteem others better than yourself to the point that you see them as better than you and you assist them? And most Christians today are only out to assist themselves. A lot of people believe Kobe Bryant was a ball hog and wanted to score all the points himself. If you are a leader or something in the ministry, when is the last time you assisted someone else in their ministry? But I see a lot of preachers that will only promote themselves. Now verse 2 in Romans 16 says that ye receive her in the Lord as becometh saints, and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you, for she hath been a Secure of many and of myself also. So she's been a secure of many. That means she's she's helped a lot of people. Have you helped someone else lately? He says in verse 3, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus. So the Lord is looking for someone who wants to help someone else. Priscilla and Aquila were husband and wife and were tent makers along with Paul. 
and you get to know someone when you work with them. So I'm assuming he knew their character very well and still thought highly enough of them after he got to know them. Do the people you work with think highly of you after they've got to know you and worked alongside you? Now Romans 16:4, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I gave I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Have you ever heard the saying they stuck their neck out for me? This is where that comes from in this verse. People could see that Paul was the real deal, and they were willing to stick their neck out for him. And Paul says in Galatians 4.15, he says, Where is then the blessedness ye spoke of, spake of? For I bear ye record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. So people would have laid down their necks and plucked out their own eyes for Paul. Do you have Christian friends you would do this for? Would you lay down your life to save a brother? Romans 16.5, Likewise greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well-beloved Epinetus, who is the first fruits of Achaia unto Christ. So he says, greet the church that is in their house. In verse 5, and churches many times start in homes. There is certainly nothing wrong with having a house church, just like there's nothing wrong with the church meeting in a big organized building. It's about the King James Bible being used and the preaching of the right message and no compromising on the, of the Bible. That's what it's about. All the outward religion and tradition isn't worth the time. As long as we keep it pure religion and the tradition that Paul taught, there's nothing wrong with meeting in a house or meeting in a big organized building. Now he says in verse 6, Greet Mary, who bestowed much labor on us. So how would you feel to have the fact that you labored for God's people to be written in the Bible? If you are laboring in the Lord, then it is written down in heaven. 1 Corinthians 15.58 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Timothy 5.17 says, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. So Paul commends others in this chapter for their labor. It doesn't go unnoticed. Now, Romans 16, 12, he says, Salute Tryphena and Tryphosha, who labor in the Lord. Salute the well-beloved Perses, who, which labored much in the Lord. So he's, he's just giving all these shout-outs to people who are hard workers, laborers. Romans 16, 7, Salute Andrew Nicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. So this Andronicus and Junia are fellow prisoners with Paul. I, I once read that a true, fin, true friend will bail you out when you get locked up, and a, but a best friend is right there locked up with you. That may not be true when it comes to getting locked up for something wicked, but in Paul's case, he could say his friends were fellow prisoners. Notice in verse 7 that Paul also says they were in Christ before me. This shows that the body of Christ didn't start with Paul as some men may teach. Now Romans 16, 8 and 9. Greet Amplius, my beloved in the Lord. Salute Urbane, our helper in Christ. And Stachys, my beloved. Notice that Paul isn't ashamed to tell a brother that he loves them. Paul would greet people with an holy kiss. And in 2019 in our culture, I wouldn't just go up to another dude and greet him with a kiss. Maybe you could give him a bro hug, as they say, or just give him the right hand of fellowship, as Paul did in, to Peter and John. But in Romans 16.10, he says, Salute Apelles, approved in Christ. Salute them which are of Aristobulus' household. So uh, this guy Apelles is approved in Christ, and when it comes to eternity... All born-again believers are approved. When it comes to our daily Christian walk, we need to live it in a way that we will be approved by other Bible believers. 1 Corinthians 11, 19 says, For there must also be, must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. So when a false prophet shows up, 
it really lets you know who the true Bible believers are. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So you need to study to be approved. Show yourself approved. 2 Corinthians 10.17 and 18 says, But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. So you can't just approve yourself. Lining up with the word will show men that you are approved of God. Now, verse 11 in Romans 16, it says, Salute Herodian, my kinsmen. Greet them that be of the household of Narcissus, which are in the Lord. Notice how Paul mentions greeting someone very often. Some people have a hard time simply greeting someone else. They can't just get themselves to say hello to someone in the store. But Proverbs 18.21 says, A man that hath friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. A person who has friends will be friendly first. And a lot of people walk around Walmart, see someone they know, that someone they know doesn't say hello to them, so they call them a snob, yet they didn't say anything to that person either. What you ought to do is just go up to that person and say hello to them, even if they don't see you. Now Romans 16, 13 says, Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. And I like that name Rufus. If you're expecting a boy, that's a good name for him. But this Rufus is chosen in the Lord. Notice that you're chosen in the Lord. And you're not chosen until you get in. Until you get in the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1, four says, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. It's not that God chose for us to be saved against our will. It's not that at all. It's that God chose to save anyone who chooses of their own free will to be saved by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. So you're not saved until you get in Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 2, 4 says, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. But this guy Rufus was chosen in the Lord. It says, Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Moses or Moses, mothers have a, have a huge effect on the spiritual life of their children. Behind the scenes, they, they help mold and, and shape their kids. And Paul gives a shout out to the mother of Rufus. And Paul does the same thing to Timothy and his mother and grandmother. In 2 Timothy 1, 5, it says, When I call to remembrance the unfainted faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. So, so he, he really talks about Timothy's uh, mother and grandmother in a good light. And Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.15, he says, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So Eunice and Lois taught Timothy the holy scriptures. They trained up their child in the way he should go. Too many mothers are wanting to have a career and they believe a child would just hold them back. And too many mothers think that they need to have a girl's night out several times a week and just go out and live like the devil. And there's something wrong with a mother who would rather go clubbing or to see a dirty, dirty movie with her friends than she would to be at home taking care of her kids. And there is m nothing more sick than a woman that won't take care of her kids but a deadbeat dad who won't get out of bed and go to work. He'd rather get up and play video games. But parents are dead beached these days, bunch of slobs. They don't want to help their kids. They don't care about their kids. And as they say, if you don't take care of your kids, you'll be raising your grandkids. Parents really need to step their game up. It's pathetic. Uh, Romans sixteen fourteen says, Salute Asyncretus, Phlegon, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermes, and the brethren which are with them. Notice these guys have brethren with them. They aren't off in the woods isolating themselves as a lone ranger. Romans 16, 15 and 16 says, Salute Philogolus and Ju Julia, Nereus and his sister and Olympus, and all the saints which are with them. Salute one another with an holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. Now Paul gives people a holy kiss. And like I said, that may not be a good thing to do in 2019 to just go up to another dude and just kiss him. 
they'll, he'll think that you're one of them. But Paul says the churches of Christ salute you. Salute one another because you are a soldier in the Lord's army. You've been chosen to be a soldier. And also notice that he says the churches of Christ. And I made a study a long time ago against the church of Christ cult a few years ago. And I said that you wouldn't even find the phrase the church of Christ in the Bible. Because, you know, they say that they speak where the scriptures speak and they're silent where the scriptures are silent. And But they would always go to this verse here and say, you can find the church of Christ in the Bible. But notice it says the churches of Christ. This is talking about different groups of of local believers church is it doesn't say the church of christ it's not talking about groups of people that baptize people and say it saves them the church of christ cult will go to verses about the church in the bible and use those verses to teach that it their church of christ cult is biblical so they teach a lie by using a truth about the church but the church of christ cult is not the church of the bible the church is the body of Christ. And if some of those Church of Christ people are really saved, then they're in the body of Christ. But that doesn't mean their little cult, their little false religion is of the Bible because it's not. They're teaching works for salvation. They're teaching what's called baptismal regeneration. Now Romans sixteen seventeen says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. Now, if a Christian is trying his best to live right, and he's teaching some kind of damnable heresy, then you should, then you shouldn't receive him. But if he is a, but if he's trying to live right, then you should receive him. If he's just out there teaching, you know, baptismal regeneration like the Church of Christ, he's not even trying to live right. Then, and he's just being a smart aleck then, you know, put this person away from you and avoid them. But a person that's trying their best to live right, trying their best to, to do what the, the Lord wants them to do, we, ha we have no reason not to receive that person. And Ephesians 5.11 says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. And a, a saved person can take part in those, those works of darkness, and you shouldn't have fellowship with that. But we should keep unity as long as we don't condone sin or compromise on the scripture. Now Romans sixteen eighteen says, For they that are, are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. So they serve their own belly. And Ecclesiastes 6, 7 says, All the labor of man is for his mouth, and yet the appetite is not filled. So if a man is serving his own belly, then he loves money. And Paul told Timothy that the love of money is the root of all evil. So he's when, you, when a man's just living for his own belly, his God's his belly, he's living for money. And it says, By good words and fair speeches that deceive the hearts of the simple. And the best way to deceive someone is with a completely positive message. You have to remove sin, remove hell, remove anything negative, remove the great white throne judgment, the second coming, all the things the minor prophets said, pretty much anything that came out of the prophets' mouths, because the Old Testament prophets were negative. You deceive someone through flattery and smiles and preaching good things to come. You have to say, peace, peace, when there is no peace. And Romans sixteen nineteen says, For your obedience is come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple com concerning evil. So their obedience is faith, as we'll see in a minute. And he's gonna, going to have them wiser unto, unto that which is good. You should study to do good. You should study to be quiet. Figure out what's good and do it. Find out what's good and learn everything you can about it. In Philippians 1, 4, Paul gives you something to think about and says, Think about whatsoever is good. He also wants you simple concerning evil. Be aware of the wicked things going on, but don't go too far with it. You don't have to know everything about something that is evil to preach against it. For example, when Jesus says in Matthew 5, 28, he says, But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, he after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. So this verse knocks out pornography. It knocks out strip clubs. It knocks out all that junk. You don't have to look up those things to find out more about it to preach against it in a sense you want to be a watchman 
and you want to know about, you know, certain individual things that are wicked because you want to know what the kids are into these days so you can, you know, get up there and tell them that each, all this stuff's wrong. But you don't, you don't need to get too far into the wickedness of today. Be simple concerning evil. Now, Romans 16, 20 says, And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Notice he said he was going to do it shortly. He hasn't done it yet. Calvary wasn't the last kick in the teeth that the devil is going to get. Habakkuk 3.13 says, Thou winnest, winnest forth for the salvation of thy people, even for salvation with thine anointed. Thou woundest the head out of the house of the wicked by discovering the foundation unto the next Selah. So the, but the Lord is going to crush the head of the serpent. Genesis 3.15, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Satan gets his head bruised at the advent, and it looks like we get to do a little bit of the bruising because he will be bruised under our feet shortly, here directly. This head bruising thing is found throughout the Bible in many ways. Goliath a type of the Antichrist was knocked out with a stone. Sisera was stabbed through the temple with a tent peg. The Antichrist gets a deadly wound in the noggin. You know, all these bad guys keep getting their head knocked off. So we'll f we see that all through the Bible, types of that. But now verse 21 in Romans 16, Tim Timotheus, my work fellow, and Lucius, and Jason, and Sosipater, my kinsmen, salute you. Timotheus was a man ready to work it says my work fellow first thessalonians 4 11 says and that you study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you a lot of deadbeat dads out there can't get their butt up and work with their own hands they're too busy feeding the flesh they're too busy being a lazy bum and 2 Thessalonians 3.11 says, For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busy bodies. Just running their mouth all the time. The only thing that they work is their jaws. 2 Thessalonians 3.10 says, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. So if an if a, a able-bodied man... Laying on the couch, won't get up and work. He doesn't deserve to eat. We need to maintain good works. Constantly doing something for God, for someone else, and for our families. First Timothy 5, 8, But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. You're worse as a lost man out there if you won't even get up off your butt and go provide for your own family. That's disgusting. Romans 16, 22 says, I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, salute you in the Lord. Paul had some people write the epistles as he spoke the words of the Lord. And 2 Peter 1, 21 says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy, holy Ghost. So Paul spoke the words, and this dude, Ter Tertius, wrote down what he said. Now, Romans 16, 23 says, Gaius, mine host, and of the whole church, saluteth you. Erastus, the chamberlain of the city, saluteth you. And Cordus, a brother. So he's giving a salute because he's in the Lord's army. Now, Romans 16, 24, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. We can't do anything without the grace of Jesus Christ. Grace is God giving us something that we don't deserve, and mercy is Him keeping us from something that we do deserve. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God's grace is present in every age. Romans 16, 25 says, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. So God always knew that Adam and Eve would sin. He always knew the Jews would reject Jesus Christ. He always knew there would be a postponement of the kingdom and what we call the church age would take place. He had a lot of things 
kept secret since the world began. And he revealed secrets and mysteries to Paul that had been kept secret. For example, the mystery of the body of Christ and the rapture. There are some things that the Lord had in the scriptures that he didn't reveal to the people that wrote the scriptures. And there's some things that were in the scriptures we're holding in our hand that's not going to be revealed until he reveals it to some saints in the tribulation. It will all be through his word and 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 line up with the, his word, of course. But this idea that man already knows everything that is in the Bible and that any time somebody comes out with something that you've never heard, you criticize it, that's just a cocky way to handle the, your Bible study, a very conceited way. There's something called progressive revelation. Anytime a man finds something in the Bible that nobody had, had seen before, it doesn't mean it's wrong. It can be right if it lines up with the book. But Romans 16, 26, But now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. There's that obedience of faith that we talked about earlier. Notice it said, by the scriptures of the prophets. Things were, it says, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets. What's that? The things which were kept secret since the world began. Because since I have a complete Bible, I know about the life of Jesus Christ. I can go back in the Old Testament, see what those prophets wrote, and I can see Jesus Christ on every page. They couldn't do that, and neither could the apostles. That's why the Lord had to go back and show it to them after his resurrection. In Luke twenty four twenty seven, it says, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them and all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now look at 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12. It says, Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which is in them did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Now look at this. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things, which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. So notice, the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow wasn't revealed unto, the, um, unto themselves, the prophets that wrote it, but unto us they did minister the things, because now we have the Bible and we can look back and see all those things. But now moving on. Romans sixteen twenty seven To God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Written to the Romans from Corinthus and sent by Phoebe, servant of the church at Sincrea. So once again you see Phoebe is greatly used of the Lord, just like any great woman of faith would be. They say the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. Each man that stands up and does something for God was raised by his mother if she was worth anything at all. A woman has a huge effect on the life of their son or daughter. But this is the end of Romans chapter 16 and completes the book of Romans.